We're back on the road this April with our live show, Cocaine Cowboys. If you want to hear the story of Ireland's love affair with Colombian powder and those who made millions in the gold rush, limited availability remains in Belfast at ulsterhall.co.uk. That's ulsterhall.co.uk. So, Sue, I listened to your podcast, Million Dollar Lover, and I've recommended it to anybody who's looking for a podcast. I was absolutely intrigued. I binged it, uh, which is always a good sign. And uh, I wanted to talk to you because there's so many issues brought up in it. Um, But first of all, maybe for those who haven't yet heard it, set the scene and give us a little bit of an idea of what it's about. Yeah, so Million Dollar Lover is, is nice to be on the show as well. Thank you, Nicola. You're it's, welcome. Uh, Million, Million Dollar Lover is an um, eight-part, ten-part series, sorry, um, that basically follows the love affair between an 80-year-old, very wealthy American widow called Carolyn and a 57-year-old builder called Dave who comes to do some odd jobs for her. And he moves in with her two weeks after appearing on the scene. And obviously he... There's a lot about him we discover. Effectively, he's been homeless. He's been in and out of prison. He sees this as his chance of redemption, really, of living a sort of more more stable life. And Carolyn had been very lonely, so she really embraces the relationship. And I was alongside them as it all unfolded, encountering the opposition that they encountered from her daughters worried about the money and the finances, the family wealth, where would the money go? Um, and how and the threat that they felt from Dave being there, and also his family who've struggled with a lot of problems of addiction and homelessness, and you know have had some really grim times. Suddenly, for them, there was a sort of more stable presence with with their dad, sort of mm. enjoying enjoying a um, well a roof o- really. and, a, and a, yeah. ro- a roof over his head at the at the very least, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, what was Amazing, like from a podcasting point of view, I don't know whether this will interest those out there who don't make them, but was that you were there from the beginning. And of course, there was a reason for that, but that you were there with your microphone out. And we do follow this in real time as such, as all this is unfolding. You're not going back and interviewing people in in retrospect. Um, I think that's something that makes an incredible uh either audio or, or, you know, visual experience for people when they they feel they're on this journey with people. Um, but the reason that you were there at hand was because Carolyn was actually a neighbour of yours. I know, isn't that amazing? I mean, my husband's American and uh, he lives in this really nice or sleepy seaside, seaside town in California. And it really is quite idyllic. I don't get to be there all the time, obviously, because I'm working at the BBC in London. But I was there... At the point my uh, our lives intersected with Dave and Carolyn's, it was quite soon after David moved in and he was wanting to do some odd jobs in the neighbourhood. So he kind of came to our house um, on this little cul-de-sac uh, asking for work. And as he was as he was there, he was talking to me about his new love affair. <laughs> and he told me this, you know, his girlfriend was 80. And uh, I was immediately intrigued, really. Obviously, the age difference made it interesting, but to see him as well he's tattooed from head to toe he's kind of he drinks really heavily he's he's quite a character he draws you into his world but you know he's very unusual character and uh yeah this was quite an affluent little seaside village and Carolyn was I knew I I didn't actually know her although we lived on the same street yeah but you know she I knew that just to even live on that street those homes are sort of worth an awful lot of money and as it transpired, she was worth millions because her and her late husband had built up a property portfolio. So I think the fact they were neighbours and this story, I didn't know where it would go. So I think I really wanted to take listeners with me yeah. as I uh, as as it as it sort of unfolded, and that's what I tried to do with the recordings. So Dave is kind of a drifter type. He's you know rugged looking. He's not everyone's cup of tea, but, you know, you could call him. He's kind of an interesting looking character. Um, And Carolyn is a little bit hippy dip as well, isn't she? She's just just sort of a little bit alternative. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. And and the area where they collide, where they meet is one of these classic places that the, you know, probably was like anywhere until 
the house prices started to rise in California, the homeless crisis began and, you know, probably what is happening in Dublin, there's many areas of Dublin, we don't have the sunshine, but where, you know, people, ordinary people are living in what could be considered millionaires row by people outside, but they've never known their proper to be, property to be anything but their home. It doesn't yeah, have to exactly say, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he rolls into town uh, and just sort of starts looking for little odd jobs, cutting grass, that kind of thing. Yeah, well, he's just come out of prison. He got a 10 year stretch for trying to blow up what Walmart, the supermarket train. He was making pipe bombs in the desert, but had become convinced that he has a lot of conspiracy theories. So he became convinced that Walmart was trying to microchip us all, uh-huh. probably because he was taking a lot of crystal meth. And in prison, he tried to turn his life around, got released and decided to cycle up the California coast to to raise money for homeless veterans. That's a long story, but he had this plan anyway. That yeah. When he was homeless, he'd met a lot of veterans. And uh, Tayukas, he just took one look at, in the sleepy town. He sat by the statues of dolphins and he just said he felt like he'd come home. And people in the church sort of welcomed him in because they were running some schemes for the homeless and uh, offered offered to find him some odd jobs. And Carolyn's was one of the first odd jobs he did in the town. And he says he, she offered him accommodation. Um, and then a few weeks later, she invited him up to her bedroom. She told him she was very lonely. And, you know, he said he wanted the company too. So they became lovers at that point. So a few things there now before you go any further. Um, uh, so was he open and honest about that part of his life that he had been in prison and that, you know, he wanted to, he'd cycled up the coast. Like when he's knocking on your door looking for odd jobs, is he telling you I've just been released from prison? I've lived homeless. Yeah. Well, when he came to the door looking for the odd jobs, he, he had his top off and he had 5150 tattooed across his chest, which, I mean, I didn't know that, but I looked it up. It's like a police code for sort of criminally insane and dangerous. And he he would joke about his prison days. So really early on, he was open about all that. And he, I think he just saw that, obviously, he'd done a really lot of bad things. He had a lot of offences in his past, but he put it all down to the drug use. I mean, I think... As it sort of emerged with him, he'd had a really terrible childhood and the yeah. odds were stacked against him. So I, th- he, this, I think Karen was one of the first people that had taken an interest in his life in truth. Mm. The fact that she really thought he could do good and praised him so much. You know, every job he did, she'd be round at the house looking, phrasing into the heavens. You know, she really believed in him and uh, thought he had talents and, and a real future. She comes across sort of daft and love teenagerish <laughs> with them. And I mean, I, I felt for her daughters when they, you know, started to come in to the podcast. And I, clearly when they, uh, I think they asked their mother straight out, was she was she sleeping with this guy? I think they had probably hoped that he was just sleeping in the shed. Um, and then they have to deal with that idea that their 80 year old mother is having a sexual relationship with a uh you know, a man 20 odd years, her junior, who is a sort of homeless vagrant looking type. Mm. Like that is a lot to deal with for, for, for them. Imagine, imagine if it was in your home. I mean, like imagine that, you know, however would you go about that? Yeah. Like, it's almost impossible to think of, isn't it? Because she was, te- you, you said she, she was giddy, really. She was giddy with love. She was like a teenager in love. That's how they saw it. They thought it wasn't a real love, you know, proper relationship, really. They thought it was more just her age. She had. They thought she had some kind of cognitive decline and that they thought that made her vulnerable, really, to, to you know, this charade, as they saw it, that Dave was putting up. Um, and and they didn't believe a word of it. But she, it's really difficult. She was open with me about her the sex life, and and he was actually. So you know, mm. she obviously got a lot from physical connection with him, and she just treasured him like some rare jewel. You know, if he was out late at night, she would be round at mine, sort of worrying about where he was. She was jealous of his interactions with younger girls on the beachfront. She. She thought, I, I, I mean, it, it's difficult. Mm. I for the daughters, it was really, really upsetting. And like you say, they they asked their mum about the sexual relationship. They actually called the police, mm. saying that their in their view, their mum didn't have 
consent. She couldn't give consent because they claimed that she had incapacity mentally, but no doctor had assessed her as such. The doc- her own doctor had, you know, ruled out Alzheimer's um, mm. and said she was perfectly capable of making her own decisions. So they were in an impasse because obviously without a medical diagnosis, they couldn't move to protect the, the money. And for them, millions of dollars were at stake here. I- Our, you know. And that was the point with them as a listener. I kind of fell in and out of love with them. You know what I mean? The daughters, I kind of, mm. you know, at times completely saw where they were coming from. And then at times I was like, well, is it their business? You know, it's her money. She can do what she wants, but it's her life. And should your life end because, you know, people don't find it very OK that you're 80 and you might be having a, a relationship. And there was that constant kind of roller coaster of emotions through the podcast. And obviously all the while you're finding out little bits about his background. You're finding out little bits about what he's doing that don't really tally with what he's telling her. Um, I, I found the same with him. I, I, I sometimes liked him and sometimes thought he was a, a baddie. Sometimes I thought he was OK. Um it was quite extraordinary. How long were you recording and how were you doing that? I mean, obviously you're not doing that every day, even though it feels like you are. No, it's so funny you say that because I think it was, that's exactly how I saw it. So that was kind of for me the interest in keeping recording because you know you like to try and make sense of everything. But my feelings would ever flow. Like sometimes you saw things and you thought, no, it doesn't look right. And then you just, it was a, it was a roller coaster ride for sure. Mm. And I think people listening get a real sense of that, which I think is a true sense. Because I think sometimes these kind of relationships are that difficult to assess and to sort of make sense of and unravel. And I recorded with them for a year. Um, I didn't set out with any agenda on it. And it wasn't commissioned by the BBC. I was just doing it in my own time. So mm. I wasn't with them every day, but I was with them every holiday and every time I was back with my husband or, you know, back and forth um, in between work, work assignments, I'd be there. And I'd always try and sort of be with them when I knew things were happening or, you know, they'd sometimes call me, yeah. update me on stuff. Um, they all liked, I think, being part of the process. So I'd get calls from them even when I was away from them. So it felt like I kind of was properly abreast of what was going on for the whole 12 months pretty much. It's extraordinary to get that access though as well and especially when you're dealing with all those emotions and I suppose the the relationship with her daughters becomes very fractured as the relationship with with Dave gets more intense and the problems emerge. Like did some of them at any point want to pull the plug? Did they want to pull away from it? Did they tell you to put your microphone down and you know this was their private business or how did... Yeah, that's always the fear, isn't it? Because yeah. obviously you you really are that up, up close and personal. And there were moments where I, you know, when I saw Dave use crystal meth, I, I thought for sure he'd want that pulling or, you know, he'd tell me to stop recording. But that, those weren't a problem. But the moments that, I, that were really problematic were much more to do with his relationship with his children. And there were a couple of moments during those recordings where he did want to sort of stop me and where he got quite sort of aggressive about what I was trying to record with him. Mm. So there were two in particular. There's his daughter, Cody, who I sort of really liked and actually sort of saw outside of Dave um, to record with her. She'd struggled with drug addiction and he, she blamed him really. I, she was very forgiving of him in lots of ways, but she, she, his, her child had been really terrible and it kicked off once when we'd made this arrangement to go and see her and he got really sort of really angry and aggressive with me about it trying to interfere in their relationship. And it's, I hadn't crossed that line actually, because this actually had been his arrangement with Cody that he'd made, but he'd kind of forgotten that and I got the blame for it. And there was another time when I went to see a daughter, his other daughter he'd he'd had no contact with. And it's quite interesting part of the podcast because the whole backstory is that he'd sold this daughter Mm. and I found her. And I think he thought that part of his past would never come out. And he really was furious about that. Yeah, but, because when I asked you at the beginning, did he kind of, when he arrived looking for odd job work, did he hide his past? He certainly didn't hide some parts of it, but he did mm. very much hide. And we all maybe have secrets that we don't want to come out and certainly not on a BBC podcast. 
Um, So those kind of things were uncovered during it and, and you were there for those emotions and those moments. You were never going to get the backing for Carolyn if you went up against Dave. I mean, she wouldn't pretty much back her own daughters against him. Um, so there must have always been that worry that they would say to you, we don't want this going out or when you're in the middle of it, do you, are, are you, you know, are they in then? Well, I, at the beginning, they'd all signed an agreement. I mean, I, it's a difficult area because obviously you wouldn't want to hold someone to an agreement just because they'd signed it at the beginning. Of course. But it, I, I think I'm really honest and open and I was with them all the way through about what I was recording what how it would be used and even when Dave sort of erupted I talked through with him like how why I needed to do that mm. and it is fair to say he calmed down and he backed off his kind of yeah I think he saw it there wasn't ever a point where any of them said you know we just don't want this to go out there were there were a couple of moments with Dave where he erupted but I think I kind of got quite an honest note from relationship with them all. And is it because sort of... is it because they're Americans that they let you so far in? Like because I mean it's just yeah. so non-British or non-Irish for this kind of stuff. I mean, this is like, I mean, if this was happening here, I'm sure it is, and we're going to get on to that. And in the UK, um, you know, an elderly person getting into a relationship with a younger uh man who's maybe seen as being a uh somebody who's looking for their money. Um and the, those problems in families, it seems like it's something that really would be hidden on this side of the pond, that there'd be just too much shame attached to that. But the Americans are much more open to media, aren't they? And much more friendly with microphones and, and, and cameras and yeah. things like that. It's, it's unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> like it's jaw dropping. I, I mean, I, for me, I'll never believe that, you know, the bank manager, Carolyn's bank manager, I, I thought she'll never talk to me about the finances here, you know. And obviously, I really wanted to know where the money was coming out of her account, what was happening. And she said, oh, yeah, sure, I'll come to your house and do an interview. And she turned up, put the microphone on. I mean, isn't that amazing? Like in, in, in Britain, Ireland, you, you'd never get people at all levels wanting to talk. And just in the, people's ordinary lives, Americans are so articulate, aren't they? Even going to the river bottom where the homeless were and, sort of meeting, you know, friends of Dave's, so articulate about their circumstances and so wanting to talk and share all that. Amazing, really. I think maybe you could find it here. I mean, there are wonderful people who take you into their lives here, but it's hard to find a complete story here where everyone's happy to talk. That's probably the truth. Yeah, it's difficult. I remember years and years ago, I had a news agency here with a a journalist friend of mine, Lynn Kelleher, and we'd often get calls from the Daily Mail and they'd be doing some sort of a feature and they'd say to us, you know, I won't do the accent because it would be deeply insulting to any of our English listeners uh, as well as everything else. But they'd say to us, can you go out and ask 20 people uh, about their sex lives? We want to, you know, mix some Irish voices in there and we'd go 20. We're not going to get one. Like we are just not going to get one. And that's the way it was. Like you just, people were so closed here compared to even the UK. I'm talking 20 years ago. Um, But America seems, you know, it is very open and the people are very open and we see interviews even on social media going on with homeless people who are going into their background and they're telling us everything and why they're taking these drugs. And okay, maybe there's a financial gain for them on some of the um, the more citizen journalism thing. But why are they why are they so screwed up in so many ways when they're so much more open than us? As a society, I mean. I think it's really hard when you live in a society with no safety net. You know, like I think having no sort of health service and no proper sort of welfare Mm. sort of provision, I think it makes it really difficult. And one of the things that I thought came across quite strongly in the series really was that huge disparity between the sort of wealthy in this sleepy, you know, Californian town and the homeless who are sort of, had been really priced out of the whole state because rents are so expensive. You couldn't even hold down a a job, a basic job, and sort of be able to afford to rent somewhere. The disparity is so huge. And there's so little, I think there's so little, well, I mean, obviously the church is really fantastic and there's a lot of support, but there's so little understanding really of what people's lives are like there. Mm. So I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of problems hidden behind the surface in America and, 
they are open about talking about them, but that doesn't actually bring them nearer to solving them. Mm. A lot of it is it's change you'd probably need at a national level and that for all its faults, yeah. our systems of sort of, at least we pull people up and, and we're alongside people in a, when they really need it. Well, we, we at the that, very least, I mean, there's obviously massive problems with homelessness, etc. here and in the UK and, and all that. But at the very least, I think we have a social welfare system, which is better than the States and a health care, some, some p- part of a health care system. We spend a lot of time giving out about it. But when you look at the way all those people were living in California that you spoke to, I mean, talking about California for a moment, I mean, it was the dream, you know, the California dream and uh, beautiful mm. weather, you know, fabulous beaches, all the rest of it. But it has, it is the homeless capital of the States. And people, have they flooded in there? Or are they from there? A bit of both. Well, I, I think both. I mean, obviously they kind of thought a, a few, say a decade ago, that most of the homeless in California, most of the homelessness came from outside of California. People wanting the sun, you know, if you're going to be homeless, living in a warm, sunny state, probably preferable but more and more they're seeing that the homeless problem in the state is generated within the state by the fact you know no one can afford to rent and and the property market has just gone so high that people that can't can't really live there and that was one of the things I really appreciated through Dave like getting to see that in a way that you don't I mean I was there living with my husband and maybe hadn't I never saw some of the things he saw I never saw some of the massive I mean same you mentioned Dublin but areas where there's people on the sort of banks water river mm. banks and you know ditches like whole swathes of people sort of living in, in almost hidden dips in the sort of earth really that you wouldn't normally see and he would stop and talk to everyone and you've got a real sense that a lot of these people have been holding yeah have been working Maybe drug addiction also is, and, and addictions in general play a role there. But a lot of those people we met um, had, you know, been holding down jobs and had been doing all right. But more recently, that's all come apart because of these, you know, economic sort of pressures in the state. Mm. And you mentioned drug use and crystal meth is particularly one of the, mm. coming obviously from the Mexican cartels, Um it's a drug that hasn't really caught on either here or massively in the UK or Europe, actually. Um, it is obviously much available in California because of its proximity to the the um, areas of production. But it's highly addictive, isn't it? It's, 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 a, it's like a heroin. It's not a recreational drug, crystal meth. No, it's and it's really, really terrible to hear the impact it has when you know when Dave's children sort of grew up in this house where he was he was paranoid really through crystal meth use. He uh, he built a tunnel under the house when they were kids so that he could escape from the police if he was ever raided. He hammered in aluminium foil onto the windows so because he believed they were being bugged. He wouldn't let them go out of the house. He took photos of trees because he said they were secret phone mass that people, the government was listening in on them. I mean, crystal meth ravaged their childhood and in turn, they've gone on to sort of suffer crystal meth addiction too. It's passed through the generations. And when you go on the river bottom, he was there taking crystal meth with other people who are homeless. It's so cheap. They said, you know, it's so cheap to buy it. And it's such a hugely addictive thing. Mm. And it's so hard to believe I'm so glad we don't have it in that sort of sense here in those ways because you see it's causing horrendous problems in the states and, and fentanyl as well of course and of course it, it sort of you know takes a grip in the same way heroin has done probably here and in the UK during times uh, in in areas that are marginalized where, where people are suffering those, you know, homelessness, obviously in the States, they have the extra, uh, they don't have the health care. There seems to be an awful lot of mental health uh, problems within those homeless communities as well that they just were never treated maybe or identified or, um, and I wanted to ask you that, obviously, neither you or I are medical, but with Dave, did you feel it was the crystal meth that created what he was or w- was there maybe something there in his own background beforehand? It's hard to know that for sure, isn't it? I mean, he 
it, his own sort of view of it was that he, I mean, he eventually opened up about the abuse he'd suffered as a child. And I think his view was that he had never dealt with that, like that was completely bottled down and that, that maybe that fueled some of the addictions mm. and then erupted into sort of periods of mental illness because he wasn't put into a psychiatric unit um, when he he stabbed a man and uh, was accused of stabbing a man and was put held in a psychiatric unit because he was deemed unfit to stand trial for that. And they kind of diagnosed him then with mental, with mental illness, but mm, it's hard. I think his view was that he... Yeah, it was a reaction to the. He was a damage. He was a, a damaged human, really, but he was mm. capable of of kindness, and we we saw that and heard that towards uh, Carolyn. Like he did seem to, he had an affection for her. I don't think she, he he was daftly in love with her as she was with him, obviously. But um, she provided something for him, uh, uh, which was a companionship, a home, obviously. Do you think he went into it from the beginning, seeing the wealth that he could go, you know, he could he could move towards or, or agitate towards? Or did that come over the course of the relationship? Was it premeditated? I, really, yeah. I mean, it's really interesting. I'll never know for sure. So this is only my view as I sort of got to know them all. I think really for Dave, Carolyn's wealth, was unimaginable, I think, because he'd lived all his life with no real money and had scrabbled from odd jobs to odd ends and, you know, spent so much on drugs and never had anything concrete, any possessions even, really. And I think the idea that she had millions, I don't think he could conceptualise it. And the longer, he, and I really don't think he sort of saw it at the beginning. I think she was offering him some stability and, you know, friendship and somewhere stable where he could you know lay his head and I think he genuinely really wanted her approval and her love and warmth and I think as he was there it became more apparent she was foisting more of the financial work you know sorting her accounts out onto him so he was seeing it and he say to me you know he was staggered I think he was absolutely staggered by the fact she'd have like bank accounts with thousands and thousands of pounds and you know the idea that you've just got that but you could just go to the bank yeah. and draw 20,000 or 30,000 like I don't think he thought really of the, the money being in that sort of yeah that accessible and and the millions that the properties were worth and she started promising him property and at some point, I, although I don't think he'd gone into it with that in his mind, I think he thought, you know, well, he, he, that could save me. Like, I, yeah, I could have that. And it, maybe it clicked in that to get that, he'd need to then be more proactive. So he, I think there was a switch. Mm. Uh, that's kind of what I felt I saw in him. There was a switch where he became more controlling about the mon money and m maybe initiated by her really but where he thought yeah that I'm going to get some of this and I'm going to have it and this is how I'm going to do it. So we've spoken I suppose a little bit about his dark past his history um you know his vulnerabilities and his aggression but Carolyn so an 80 year old wealthy widow who'd worked all her life and her and her husband they they didn't get what they had or what she had easily she in a way was a result of that you know growing property prices they had invested, hadn't they, in properties, which was her real wealth and assets. But she was really lonely. She'd lost her husband. She seemed to have had quite a normal sort of marriage as such, as much as we can make out. And uh, her daughters had grown up, were living their own lives. But she had a good relationship with them and grandchildren. But she was fundamentally lonely, which made her sort of vulnerable to the likes of Dave. Yeah, it's really. I think that is really interesting because her neighbour cares for a dozen or so elderly women living in that community, and she said to me, "It doesn't matter what age they are; they all want to find love. Like you never really, as you age, you never want to give up on that idea that you'll you you'll fall in love, you'll be loved. It's such a yearning she sees in people, even when they've got their family around them, even when they've got you know the people visiting them." And for Carolyn, it took on a sort of extra level because her daughters weren't really there much of the time. And 
she was just really suffering after her husband died. She carried his ashes in the boot of her car for a long time and she talked to him all the time. He'd been her one and only love up to Dave arriving on the scene. And I I think she just she she probably in her mind wasn't thinking I want love, you know. I don't think she she this came upon her, but once it did, there was no stopping her. So, well, at the same time, yeah. she never caught, caught herself on, if you know what I mean. Like, you, you, you know, <laughs> she she had this crazy infatuation for the guy and she never seemed to no. kind of at any point question that. No, no, she didn't even like ask the basic. She didn't listen to people who try and question it either because she was, she was just sure she was right. I, maybe it's partly a case that in families where these things happen maybe there is a maybe a need for a more gentle sort of approach from the children in a way because I think they forced her to take sides by their complete opposition so there was kind of no meeting in the middle I mean they were so horrified I'm not saying I wouldn't be so mm. I'm not judging them but I think it's very hard if you if you're in these situations and you can't seem to find navigate a middle way because, in effect, their mother's loyalty shifted completely to Dave. To Dave. And, but it looked like yeah. the way I felt, the way they came at it, it looked like it was all about the money. Uh, and that way to her that, you know, while they were reassuring her that they cared for her, they loved her and they wanted the best for her, certainly it was like as if the shutters had come down from her on that and, and all she could see was this was about the money and, and you know, she'd do what she goddamn wanted with her money and yet didn't come across as a very feisty per- person. But in that kind of manner, she was. Um, do you think, Sue, that she knew she mightn't have had that long left? That Well, she would say to me, she would, that was bizarre because she would have these conversations with Dave about where they wanted to be buried and I was saying to her but you know you would probably like that's really going to be a thing for you really I don't see I think she saw in her mind she just kind of forgot how old she was sometimes she just thought you know they were in this kind of relationship or she'd just laugh it off and say and and he'd say to her you're going to be here for five more years or ten more years he he would encourage this idea that she was like you know going to carry on so I don't think she was thinking short term about this at all really Mm. I think she thought that she had longer in and they would they talked about going to get married and it wasn't really that she wasn't going to do it it was just that she at that moment at those moments she just kind of wasn't up to making this they had this dream of going to Vegas and marrying in a sort of little chapel there and she just wasn't quite up to it then Mm. but she didn't she wasn't saying like I'm too old or I'm not going to see much longer of my life. Not really. And what's interesting for us in in all of this is, as you pointed out from the beginning, there was nothing wrong with her capabilities. She was an adult making decisions. There was no doctor that was saying that she was, had lost her mental faculties or whatever, Mm -hmm. um, that she couldn't make these decisions. But is there some coercion is there something there and is is this a wider issue for many people out there you know vulnerable probably women and men by the way uh, older men who have wealth and um maybe that's more acceptable when they take a younger woman is it well i think it's really difficult for both for both sexes so so i think this is something i didn't really appreciate until i started making this and i spoke to some geriatricians and uh I hadn't appreciated really that even aside from diagnosis like Alzheimer's or, you know, a cognitive decline, there is some loss in cognitive function as we age that you would expect as you age. And that often that comes down to sort of difficulties managing your money. People might struggle more with certain aspects of their life and managing money is definitely one of them. And aside from any sort of diagnosis, you could see in Carolyn that she couldn't manage the finances. And that, and after the series has gone out, I've had letters from people, so many correspondents from people where they've seen this same pattern replicated in relationships between, you know, their parents, the parent and a sort of new lover, an older sort of parent who is struggling with finances and suddenly someone sweeps in and takes control of it. And that's happening to men and to women. And mm-hmm. I think 
yeah, I think it's it's a lot to do with how we just cannot. There are some things in our lives that get too complex the older we get, and that is definitely one of them. Mm. And obviously, you know, people are always advised to try and consider making a power of attorney decision before they are at a point where, you know, maybe they're they're too old to identifying somebody in their lives who they believe to be trustworthy and good and have their best interests in heart that they can, I suppose, sign over those financial decision making uh, things to for the future before they get to a point where well, that, that's quite hard because Carolyn did have a power of attorney, but mm. which the daughters wanted to invoke because they claimed that she couldn't manage and that they should be taking control of the finances. As you said, they were really set on managing this money, yeah, <laughs> family yeah. fortune. And I guess this is what happens quite a lot. But because she had no diagnosis and she wouldn't relinquish control, mm. they couldn't do they anything. They couldn't do anything I, with us, yeah. Mm. So the power of attorney is a good thing to have, I'm sure, for people that does work but you need, if you've got then this hostility in the family where you know heckles are up and you're not they're not gonna they're not trusting each other then it still doesn't sort of get around that essential problem and some of the people that have written in have seen that play out into changing wills I mean they these situations are so real mm. that, that a new love um an elderly sort of parent or you know uncle or whatever you know can, can change rewrite wills right up to the last minute and that suddenly yeah. fortunes can just shift out of a family and it's for right or for wrong I mean like you obviously don't know the ins and outs of everyone's stories but I think it is much more common than anyone's talking about and that's kind of one of the things that, one of the reasons that interested me in doing the series and one of the things that's happened since then that so many people have written in with such distressing stories about mm. their own situations. I've no doubt. And I mean, I suppose in, in Million Dollar Lover, we're observing something that uh, there's probably no real answers to what to do about it. Or have you uncovered that, perhaps not in this case, but that there is a vulnerability there in older people, maybe in the likes of California, maybe in some wealthier areas, the UK and Ireland too, that there is some active, um, you know, that people are actively targeting them I think in these exactly romance the scams. You know, that's what, 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 what we hear about. I spoke to a consultant about it in uh, Derbyshire in some of those really gorgeous villages, probably the same in Ireland, you know, really beautiful places. And they are seeing this. They are seeing people sort of target lonely older people. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely happening. It's mm. definitely happening, and it because property is so much wealth now in in a, in sort of home ownership, and younger generations are so priced out of it. So it doesn't even have to be strangers. I think it's happening a lot within families. I think yeah. you know, elderly people are vulnerable within their own families, and sometimes that is the biggest danger. And they might have a new lover who's you know nothing but goodness. And they might have a child sort of trying to take everything from them mm -hmm. and a sibling trying to take everything from other siblings. I mean, it doesn't always play out in the, in the way I saw it play out in The Million Dollar Lover. Yeah, I thought but life I was supposed to get easier the older you got. <laughs> it's obviously just gets it's... so much more complex and dear God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of, it's a bit worrying to think about, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. It's another worry now to roll around the bed at night worrying about. Tell me this much, Sue, because like as journalists, we would be we would be ill advised to do uh, work around our neighbourhoods. Uh, you know what I mean? Are we not? We'd sort of always work to sort of, you know, operate a little bit further afield than in, in our own cul-de-sacs. But uh, you did. How has it gone down? And... Are you finding yeah. that you can hold your head up high? <laughs> well, actually, since it's gone out, I've been so busy. I haven't actually been able to get, get No, I've only been out a couple of times. And now uh, I, uh, it, yeah, you should, probably we should never do things. Because obviously up until then, Cayucas have been a sort of my little safe space because I do some quite yeah. uh, difficult investigations by and large. And I'd always gone back there and it had quiet times but now everyone wants to talk to me about Dave and Carolyn and it's really interesting actually because 
some people have written in to say they've gone to Cayucas just to see. Oh. <laughs> They're like, they've gone, they've gone there specifically to see and people have sort of put it on their travel itineraries to go and try and check out. But um, oh. I've, I've always been in touch with like people like Cody and stuff, you know, Pete, uh, uh, Dave is back. Well, I don't want to give the end away. So it's yeah. kind of, I probably won't say it, but it's fine giving back. It's, it's fine being back. And, uh, it's interesting to see the impact it's had there and to see really in the way that some people have taken from it, like a lot of, yeah, it has made them reconsider, I think, mm. partly how they, how they're living with, with homeless people on their doorstep and, and their own responses to that. That's kind of some of the conversations that people have had with me. It's made them think and reflect on that much more deeply. Yeah, most certainly. And I think probably to recognise that, you know, things don't start ticking just because you get you get older, like older people have their needs too. And they have that, you know, those relationships they have with grandchildren and with adult children aren't uh, uh, the same as a relationship they have with a member of the opposite sex or the same sex or whatever they're interested in. Um, and that is maybe you know, a loss. And maybe I suppose as society, if we start recognising that those needs don't die off when you hit the age of the pension, we might be in a better place ourselves. Um, But look, absolutely brilliant. I'd advise everybody to go listen to this if they haven't. And I mean, they don't need me to tell, tell, tell listeners here to listen to it. I, everybody's talking about this. It's the podcast definitely of the of the moment. And I think it's just going to keep growing and it'll be all word of mouth. You don't need any advertising for this one, you know. So, <laughs> Thank congra- you so much. congratulations. I loved it. And we'll talk again soon. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's really lovely to be on as well. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, soon. Thank you. I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.